This is a UC San Diego Blinkcast. As many of you know, the Health and Wellness Lecture Series is something that is offered uh, monthly on topics related to health issues, personal well-being, and disability prevention and management. Uh, we'd like to thank our co-sponsors, the UC San Diego Medical Center, the Vice Chancellor of External and Business Affairs, the School of Medicine, as well as the Community Advocates for Disability Rights and Education. UCSD's Accommodation Counseling and Consulting Services is pleased to uh, present Ms. Vicki Newman, who is the Director of the Nutrition Services for UC San Diego Cancer Prevention and Control Program. Ms. Newman is a registered dietitian with a master's degree from San Diego State University. She has specialized in women's nutrition for more than 30 years, including an active role in setting statewide practice guidelines for nutrition care for women in California. In this presentation, Vicki Newman will discuss developing strategies to help individuals change their eating habits and successfully adopt and maintain a healthy eating pattern and help them better understand how diet can prevent and control disease like cancer. Please welcome Ms. Vicki Newman. Thank you. Thank you all for being here. Um, can you hear me okay? Because it sounds like I'm mic'd. Yeah? Good. Um, okay, well let me do a little bit of um, explaining of some of our programs really briefly and then we'll get into the topic at hand. Um, some of you may know that we give free lectures over at the Cancer Center every month. I do Fighting Cancer with Your Fork, which um, was filmed here a couple of years ago, and you can go on the website for the wellness series and actually, in the comfort of your own home or office, can listen to it, or you can come um, and see what new developments have occurred since I gave it two years ago. Um, we also give um, cooking classes free to the community um, every month, we give seven of them, either there's several during the day and some in the evening. Um, the theme changes every month, and we're doing um, Fabulous Fiber this month, it's March. Um, in January we do um, Comfort Foods, but it, it changes every month. So I encourage you to take a look at our website, which is on your handout and um, consider coming to one or both of those opportunities. Um, I also want to shamelessly promote our cookbook. Um, we use it as a fundraiser to support our program so we can keep on um, providing them for free. Um, it's called Food for Thought, which is the topic of the talk today. It has some of our favorite recipes in it, and I just talked to somebody who'd um, been given one as a present, and she said she cooked every single recipe in the book and liked them all except one, a cauliflower recipe. So um, if you'd like to, I, I'll just pass this around. You can take a look. We sell them for $20, including tax, and it basically all goes to support our programs. Um, you write checks if you're interested to UC Regents. Um, you can also get it at the bookstore. They have a supply of them. So um, the topic is nutrition and wellness, and there's always so much on that topic that hits the news that I thought I would talk about some things that have interested me recently. And one of those is the whole issue of inflammation and an anti-inflammatory diet. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about that, and I wanna focus of course, I'm going to say something about fruits and vegetables because I'm a dietitian and this is a nutrition talk. Um, but I also want to talk about omega-3 fatty acids, the fish oils, um, because there's, there's some things to consider in that area, especially as it relates to inflammation. And um, then I want to say a few things about vitamin D as we move on through. <coughs> so in your handout, you have many of the slides that I'm going to present. So you don't have to worry about writing down websites or some of the details. Um, and if you have a burning question, you can ask, but I'll also have time at the end to take your questions. Okay? So hang in there with me. Um, as usual, I was working on this presentation until about 15 minutes before I left to come over here. Um, all right. So there's a great little book by Barry Sears. You know Barry Sears, the zone doctor? 
Um, and it's, it's about the anti-inflammation diet. And he actually does a really nice job of explaining some very difficult and complicated um, connections and interactions with diet uh, as it affects health. And he started out by defining wellness as the absence of silent inflammation. And I thought that was actually an interesting concept. Um, inflammation being what we think of as redness, swelling, heat, or pain. And the more we um, hear about the research being done in this area, the more clear it becomes that the inflammatory process plays a role in most of the chronic diseases that we suffer from um, in this country. There is um, an inflammatory component to heart disease, diabetes, cancer, which is an area that I focus on, but also Alzheimer's disease and some of the autoimmune diseases, including rheumatoid arthritis, multiple sclerosis, and lupus. So there are some things that we can do with diet to decrease the tendency toward inflammation and thereby help protect or reduce our risk of a number of these chronic diseases um, that can occur, and particularly as we age. Um, Barry Sears does a nice job of explaining how inflammation is actually linked to the overproduction of some common hormones um, that float around in our body. Um, have you heard of these pro-inflammatory eicosanoids? Does that ring any bells? Um, it, I, don't worry about the terminology. I'm going to be talking about the fish oils or the omega-3 fatty acids and how those impact. But you can just kind of tuck in your mind pro-inflammatory eicosanoids and just think about, again, pain, swelling, heat, that sort of thing. Um, there's also a relationship with insulin. And you know, you always think of insulin when you think about sugar and refined carbohydrates. Um, but if you're talking about reducing the inflammatory process, we do need to pay attention to the types of fats that we eat. That would affect these eicosanoids and the type of carbohydrates that we eat, which would affect insulin. And then cortisol is another hormone that we think of as a stress-related hormone. Um, so if you work on stress reduction, that should decrease cortisol levels. Um, in terms of insulin, let me just put this down. Um, insulin actually, insulin which is secreted in response to our blood sugar rising, um, promotes inflammation by increasing the production. Um, and again, don't worry about the terminology. These are called pro-inflammatory cytokines. And have you heard about C-reactive protein, or has your physician measured your C-reactive protein? Has anybody had that measured? OK. Um, that is a way of looking to see if you have more than the usual amount of inflammation in your body. And more, we're seeing doctors involved in prevention proactively getting those levels to determine how you're doing. Um, but another thing that happens is insulin can promote fat accumulation in the body. And particularly as we get more fat accumulation in our middle section, we tend to produce more pro-inflammatory factors. So doing something to reduce the accumulation of fat, but also particularly fat around the middle, which, you know, as we get older, this is where we tend to, to store it. Um, excess fat reduces insulin sensitivity, and so what happens is the body, like, starts to make more of it, okay? And it's kind of a vicious cycle, because the more insulin we have, the more we put fat down in the body or store fat. So I think we all understand the importance of reducing refined carbohydrate intake, sugars, whether they be in the natural form or you know, table sugar added to things. But being careful of refined carbs and sugar is one way of keeping our insulin levels more normal so there isn't this tendency to promote inflammation. Um, cortisol is a hormone that's actually really important for our survival. It increases blood pressure in response when we need our blood pressure to be elevated. Um, and it also increases our blood sugar levels. 
and it can um, reduce immune response. So we don't, we want enough cortisol, but we don't want elevated levels all the time. That's not good for, for immunity. Um, stress and chronic inflammation can cause an increased production of cortisol. And when we have chronically high levels, we get insulin resistance, okay, which makes more insulin and more fat accumulation. So it's kind of this cycle. Um, when the cortisol levels remain <coughs> elevated at an unhealthy level, there can be some nerve damage and suppression of the immune system. Now, the quick thing to remember in terms of the way we eat, you always hear that it's important not to miss breakfast, and breakfast is the most important meal of the day. It turns out that our cortisol levels are normally elevated in the morning because we fasted through the night. So if you're just going to like down a cup of coffee and not have food, a little bit of breakfast in the morning, you are going to run higher cortisol levels. So a really good general thing to remember is to eat a little breakfast, okay, which will help to normalize your cortisol after the evening fast. Um, in general, <clears throat> with regard to the dietary issues that will help to reduce inflammation and therefore your risk of chronic disease. Um, as I mentioned, watch the accumulation of fat as we get older um, because, of course, our energy needs are going down and we have to kind of adjust that. I personally like to keep eating, so I've decided that I'm going to exercise more so that I can actually keep on you know, eating the amounts I'm used to. Um, but the more I age, the more I'm realizing I still have to ratchet down, okay? So it's, it's this balancing act. Um, and I've got to say something quick about aging and weight accumulation, because I think we're all pretty good at doing like walking, and that's great, you know, the goal being to get to 10,000 steps a day at least. And how many of you wear your pedometers? Do you have pedometers? They're wonderful reminders to, to get out and walk. Um, but the other thing that I think is really important to protect against fat accumulation as we get older is to also do some upper body exercise. So if you don't want to, you know, do weight training at the gym, um, how many of you do yoga? Do some of you? Okay. Because I, I think yoga is a wonderful way to kind of come in in a gentle way to some exercise. There's many of the positions, um, asanas, that we do that, that actually help, you know, put weight or stress on the upper body. So that's a, that's a good one to start with. Um, in terms of reducing inflammation, the second point here is to avoid excessive food intake. And I think the conceptual thing here that's important to remember is we need to break down food to get the nutrients out of it. But in breaking down food to get the good stuff out of it, we also create some oxidative byproducts. And so we need to eat to survive, but try to only eat you know, the amount that you need rather than you know, more than enough, because that's just going to make more of those you know, oxidative byproducts and kind of potential inflammatory substances. So you know, think about the holidays when you overeat, like at Thanksgiving or Christmas. You know how you get that like really hot and super full way? That, that would indicate to you that you are, you know, creating a lot of heat from the metabolism and potentially creating more of these inflammatory products. So enough, but not too much is a, is a good general rule. And um, we're going to talk more about the fats, but it's, a, it's important to watch the kind of fat that we eat. Um, we are getting a lot of what's called omega-6 fatty acids in our diets today. These are the polyunsaturated fats that come from corn oil, um, soy oil, safflower oil, um, sunflower oil. And um, <clears throat> these have a tendency when they're in excessive amounts to cause more inflammation. And they also increase your need for the omega-3 fatty acids, which we think of as the fish oils, okay? Um, so we need to get those more in balance to be able to reduce the tendency toward inflammation and therefore reduce the risk of chronic disease. Um, 
foods that are sweetened with sugar or high fructose corn syrup are particularly worrisome in terms of inflammation and triglyceride levels going up in terms of heart disease risk and diabetes we know is associated with that. So that's another good thing to keep in mind to, to reduce those. I talked about stress in breakfast. And then um, eating plenty of vegetables, fruits, whole grains, and beans is a really important way of increasing antioxidant protectors that, that help to um, modulate and protect the tissues um, and the cells from damage. In terms of total diet and how it impacts a number of chronic diseases, the Omni Heart trial was actually a very interesting trial that was geared at heart disease, but there were some kind of side effects of this fairly large change that was made in diet. Um, and as you can see, while the guidance is five to nine servings of fruits and vegetables a day, a serving being a half a cup or what fits in the palm of your hand, um, in this particular intervention, the, the goal was to get to 11 half cup servings a day. So like kind of mentally think about that. Okay, that's, that's almost six cups of vegetables, you know, cut up, lots. Um, four servings of grains, two of beans or nuts. Now, that's interesting. In our interventions with cancer patients, we ask them usually to have at least a serving of beans every other day. Um, in this particular study, they wanted them to have beans or nuts every single day and more than one serving. Um, you'll see as we move along why that's important, but it is a fairly big change from the way that we're used to eating. And four grains might seem a little bit low compared to what we're used to. If you think of serving being a slice of bread or a half a cup of cooked oatmeal. You know, when you think about when you eat oatmeal in the morning, I mean, you're eating a lot more than a half a cup. Um, and then only one serving of meat, fish, or poultry, um, a serving usually being, you know, what we think of as a deck of cards, so smaller than the palm of your hand. So very, very small amounts of animal protein in this diet. Um, two servings of milk um, products to get enough calcium. And then fats and oils, but they encourage those that were the safer types, like canola or olive oil. And then they allowed people some dessert, so you know it was tolerable, okay, but not too much. And what they found was that blood pressure went down, um, LDL cholesterol, which is the cholesterol we are particularly concerned about in terms of risk from heart disease, went down nicely, and so did triglycerides. So there were a number of factors that were beneficially impacted. So let me go back to the fruit and vegetable guidance. If we go back to this diet that we want to follow to minimize inflammation and maximize our health, minimize our risk of chronic disease, five to nine is the guidance, five to nine half cup servings, and it's based on caloric intake or body size. So small people need only five half cup servings. I'm a middle sized person, so you can use me as a kind of measure. I'm five foot seven and a half. I would need seven half cup servings. So if you're about my size, you need seven. If you're bigger than me, you could need up to nine, okay? Um, in Omni Health, they wanted people to go even further than that to 11. Um, in our interventions and based on the literature that we see on the benefits that you get from fruits and vegetables, we tell people to go for the bold, okay? Big color and big flavor, because it turns out that the stronger the color and the stronger the flavor, the more protectors are in those fruits and vegetables, okay? So when you think about strong color, you can think about, you know, red, orange, green, deep purple, um, generally what that tells you is there's more antioxidants in those foods, um, carotenoids, these are antioxidants, um, and the strong color and flavor also means that you're bringing in phytochemicals that are very protective. So have you heard me or others talk about phytochemicals? Okay, so it's a plant. It's a substance produced by a plant 
to protect the plant from damage from the environment. When we eat the plant, we get those protective substances. So a plant produces carotenoids to protect it from damage from the sun. You know, think of a leaf that has to have sunlight for photosynthesis, but too much sunlight without enough antioxidant in the leaf and it's gonna burn and then it won't be able to photosynthesize. So we eat the leaf and then those antioxidants go into us. Um, in addition to antioxidants, the carotenoids are precursors or raw material from which vitamin A is made, retinol, and that's critically important to immune functioning. So those are two critical roles that colorful you know, brings in. Um, but in terms of strong flavor, you know, if you think about citrus or you think about onions and garlic, that sort of thing, you're gonna get with onions and garlic and with the cruciferous vegetables, cabbage family, you're going to get these compounds, broadly we call them sulfur compounds, um, that actually increase the activity of detoxification systems in our body. So the plant produces them to protect the plant. We eat the plant and they help protect us. So going for big color and big flavor is really important. Let me just tell you quickly, if you haven't heard me talk before, that um, in our interventions, we ask people to eat enough colorful fruits and vegetables so when they look at the palms of their hands, they're kind of on the orange side. And that's a good way of determining that you've gotten enough carotenoids that you've actually filled up your storage tank and your fat mass, which you can see in the bottoms of your feet or the soles of your hands. And that means that you have the raw material from which the body can make retinol, vitamin A, to help in immune competence and also to help keep your epithelial cells healthy. Skin, gastrointestinal tract, genitourinary tract, some of our breast cells, a whole lot of our body is epithelial. So we need that vitamin A to keep all those cells healthy. Um, citrus fruit, in addition to being a great source of many vitamins, including vitamin A that we know is important for immune functioning, um, also includes these phytochemicals listed on the right, uh, D-limonene being one of those. And D-limonene, again, is one of those chemicals that the plant produces that we eat and it upregulates our detoxification systems. Um, I gave you a list of cruciferous vegetables because when you hear cruciferous, you usually think cabbage and broccoli, you know, and that's kind of it. But how many of you eat arugula in your salads? Okay, because see, anything that has that sulfur bite to it, that peppery taste, is going to be a good source of these sulfur compounds that upregulate the detoxification enzymes. And you can see that there's a little note on here that says, uh, raw or lightly cooked is the most useful. Um, it turns out that, have any of you cooked like corned beef and cabbage, you know, traditionally and work? Okay, so um, you know how when you cook the cabbage for a long time, you kind of smell all that sulfur in your house? Okay, but just think about that. If the sulfur's floating around in the air, it's not in the food and going into your body. Well, you might be breathing it in, but um, you want to keep it in the food so it gets in your body, okay? So undercooked is best. Um, that, that would mean, you know, quick stir fry, a um, little bit of, you know, steaming it with a small amount of water. Um, you kind of like your vegetables to be sort of what I call warmed up raw, okay? But not cooked to the point where they're just kind of like mush. You're going to get better use out of them that way. Um, and this explains, and plus there's some beautiful pictures there, <laughs> um, of all these lovely cabbages that you could use, or broccoli or arugula down there. Um, but it turns out that there's an enzyme that's activated when you chew these cruciferous vegetables a little bit. And um, it's the enzyme that's important to get the compounds that are protective out there and useful, it kind of puts them into their active form. So when we give a, a cruciferous vegetable too much heat, we're deactivating that enzyme. So just kind of remember warmed up raw is better, okay? Um, 
And I always like to put in a good word for the aromatic herbs and spices because we like to add them to food because it makes food look pretty and taste good. But these compounds, these herbs and spices that have traditionally been added to food are incredibly protective in their own right. Many of them are high in antioxidant protectors, but a lot of them have these terpenoids, which again upregulate the detoxification enzymes in the body. So the trick with herbs and spices is to use them fresh as possible. If you're going to use dried, then you want to, you know, get small amounts, okay? and use them up and then refill your bottle. And I bring that up because a lot of us shop now at Costco, you know, and we get these humongous containers of whatever. And, you know, it takes like a year to go through those. And by the time you get to the bottom, you know, you kind of open up the jar or the container and it smells sort of like straw. So just realize that if you don't have that pungent, you know, like punch of basil or oregano or whatever, it's that punch that you smell that means there's a lot of these bioactive compounds. So fresher is better. And you've been hearing about curry, right, and how important that is. Lots of protectors in curry, but in particular curcumin is found in turmeric, which is a main ingredient of curry. And again, it tends to upregulate these detoxification enzymes. So countries that use a lot of curry, like India, um, the Southeast Asian cuisines, I always think of Thai cuisine because they use curry a lot in their dishes plus lemongrass and ginger and curcumin is found in plentiful supply in all three of those components of that traditional diet. Um, and you've heard of flavonoids, I think. Um, flavonoids always come up when we discuss the what's called French paradox. And it's one of those things that, you know, we think, oh, I need a glass of red wine because, you know, it's really good for me. Um, so dark chocolate and red wine are really high in flavonoids, but so are lots of fruits and vegetables. Um, and these flavonoids broadly are ox antioxidants, <coughs> so they act to protect cells. They have antimicrobial impact. Um, they act as anti-allergenic substances, anti-inflammatory. Um, they tend to protect against cancer, heart disease, and they also are coloring pigments. So they have lots of roles. And um, I did a, was asked to give a talk on dark chocolate and red wine, an entire talk on that topic. <laughs> and um, of course, being a dietitian, I needed to like move it back to fruits and vegetables a little bit for perspective. So I did this little graph using data from the USDA. And um, what you can see highlighted is dark chocolate and how much flavonoids it has in a one ounce serving and or a fairly large glass, eight ounces of red wine, which is also very plentiful in these flavonoids. But there's lots of other choices where you get tremendous amounts of flavonoids so you don't I mean, enjoy your red wine and dark chocolate, but there are other ways to get them, okay? And um, I was sort of blown away by, look at parsley, okay? A ta two tablespoons of parsley has really quite a nice amount of flavonoids, and it brought memories back of my father, who was a great cook, and he used to always say, you know, eat your parsley on the plate. It's not just there for decoration. And I think he would have loved it if he would have seen this, you know, because it, it kind of underscores the importance or the health benefits of raw parsley. And then the other, do any of you cook with capers? You know, the bottled capers? Oh, she's making a face. <laughs> but there's wonderful things you can do with capers. But um, one tablespoon of capers, look how much flavonoid it has. And then the whole issue of tea, I think, is interesting. I mean, tea is a really great beverage in terms of protectors. And then going back to the theme of big color, big flavor, if you look at that list, you see a lot of big color and big flavor produce on it, right? So just keep all those things in mind. So fiber, we always talk about when we talk about health-promoting <laughs> diets. Um, you're picking up fiber from plant foods. That's why when we talk about a diet for maximum health, we talk about a plant-based diet. And that just means 
on your plate, you know, you want more fruits, vegetables, whole grains, and beans. And then you just think of your animal protein kind of as a condiment for extra flavor, satiety, you know, a little bit of high quality protein. But getting plenty of vegetables, fruits, whole grains, and beans means you're going to get enough fiber. And fiber, it turns out, is important, we know, for um, helping to reduce the risk of certain types of cancers, um, bowel cancer being one of them. But we also found some protection when we were studying breast cancer. We found that women in our Women's Healthy Eating and Living study who had higher intakes of fiber um, had lower rates of recurrence. And we think it may have been related to the fact that when there's enough fiber moving through your gastrointestinal tract, it tends to keep your hormone levels more normal. You're losing a little bit of it out your stool rather than just continuing to recirculate. And that could also be the case for men in prostate cancer. Um, <clears throat> and so getting enough fiber is protective, we think, against cancer. But there's also some very interesting uh, research indicating that it's beneficial with regard to heart disease prevention. And it plays a role in preventing or helping to reduce the risk of adult onset diabetes because when you get enough fiber, you tend to have more normal blood sugar curves. In other words, when you eat a diet that's filled with refined carbs, low in fiber, you tend to get these big surges in blood sugar. Okay? Then you make a bunch of insulin, crash down, get hungry, up again, down again, that sort of thing. So getting enough fiber is very important to normalize blood sugar levels. Um, I gave you that slide in your handout because I think it's important to realize that the guidance for fiber intake is 25 to 35 grams per day. The higher the range, better. Okay, But you can get right in that range by getting four to five servings, half cup servings of vegetables a day, plus two to three servings of fruit. Um, getting two or three servings of whole grains. <clears throat> and when we say a serving of beans, we're talking a half cup of cooked beans. So half a serving would be a quarter cup. You know, think about making a salad and just throwing a few garbanzo beans on it. Okay? <clears throat> or for lunch, you can have, if you ever come to our cancer center, we have great black bean chili over there, which I highly recommend. <clears throat> When um, you go to a salad bar, I like to encourage people to choose all the different vegetables that you could choose. And only if you had enough room on your plate <clears throat> to end up putting lettuce on it. Because lettuce is very low in fiber, and it's quite low, relatively speaking, in most key nutrients. So you're so much better off having all the other choices for health. Now, I have to say a few things about V8 juice because, um, actually, I'm going to get some of my water. Um, thanks. OK. Have you been seeing these ads about V8 where they have the little people walking around with like the numbers over their heads, saying how many fruit and vegetable servings they'd had for the day? And of course, the numbers are often very low. And then they drink their V8 juice, and voila, you know, the number goes way up. Um, I think V8 is fine, you know, when you can't get fruits and vegetables, you know, that are not juiced, okay? I mean, it, it, it works to give you some of the nutrients, but you're certainly not getting the fiber. Can I just drink this one quickly? Please notice, <coughs> recycled glass, because we worry about plastic. Okay. Um, <coughs> One of the things I just want to say is beware of the labels, because this happens to be this V8 fusion. And they hype you know, the blueberry pomegranate, because of course it would have antioxidants. But look at how much sugar there is in this product. Now, a lot of the sugar is probably from the fruit, um, but it's still a huge percent of calories, and you're not going to get the fiber that you need to normalize your blood sugar. So this is not the way you routinely want to get your fruit and vegetable servings. Okay? Um, V8 juice, not these um, fruit juice uh, combinations, is a better choice, but the regular V8 is just incredibly high in sodium. 
it has about a fifth of a teaspoon of salt in eight ounces. So if you got one of those bigger containers, you know, you could get a ton of salt. And if you've got a problem with high blood pressure, this is definitely an issue. You can get low sodium versions, and um, those sadly aren't as tasty, but they're a lot better for you, okay? But honestly, if you can eat your fruit, your vegetables and fruit, and not do juices for your fruit and vegetable servings, you are so much better off. Um, with regard to, you know this concept of glycemic load, which is sort of the impact a food has on blood sugar rise after that food is eaten. Um, it turns out that the non-starchy vegetables are the best in terms of normal blood sugar rise after a meal. Um, fruits are fine, you notice, because they have fiber in them. When you juice them, take the fiber away, then you're going to get elevations in your blood sugar. Um, grains are, even when they're whole grains, still can be a problem if you eat them in large amounts in terms of glucose uh, or glycemic load. And then junk food is a whole other issue. Um, so in terms of keeping your blood sugar normalized, getting enough fiber, and eating food in its whole form is going to definitely help you. And kind of going back to that first thing I talked about with an anti-inflammatory diet, it is important in terms of reducing the tendency toward inflammation. Just quickly, and we don't have much time to go over this, but I wanted you to have this website. Um, the Environmental Working Group pours over the data on pesticide contamination of produce and publishes a list um, <clears throat> which gives you an idea of the best and worst choices. And um, so there are some perfectly healthy foods on this list, produce that might or has a tendency to be more contaminated with pesticides than some other choices. It doesn't mean you don't eat these foods, but it probably might be worth an organic variety to spend that extra money especially when we go into strawberry season and people are tempted to eat strawberries, you know, several times a week, really search out an organic. Because every time you spend a little money on organic, you're voting that we have more of that choice. So that's a good thing. Did you notice how peaches are the worst choice, sadly? It has to do with how hard it is to grow stone, what's called stone fruit. It's very subject to um, pesticide or pest um, the little pests like to eat it just like we do. So um, they need to spray them more often. So using a variety of produce and using ones that are on this safer list is a good idea. But variety is, is always you know, the bottom line here. So we won't pour over the list, but you can look at that website later. Um, I also like to think or have us think about <coughs> When we eat higher up on the food chain, you know, the bigger animals that have lived longer have potentially concentrated some of these pesticides that are found in the foods that, that they're fed. So that's kind of an issue, too. Um, and there's another website that I like to guide you to if you are interested in pesticide contamination. It's called What's on My Food, and it was put up by the Pesticide Action Network, and it's recently been launched, so I think that they're going to continue to upgrade it. But for those of you that are interested in this area, you can actually tick in foods that you're interested in, and it'll give you some information that's useful. Um, and I always like to put in a plug for supporting your farmers markets, because the smaller farms locally often can't get organic certification. It costs too much money. But you can walk up to the farmers and ask how they handle pests and weeds, and you'll find that what they end up telling you often will sound you know, pretty close to sustainable or organic. Just remember, if you say, is this organic, if they don't have certification, they have to say no by law. But you can still engage them in conversation and find out what they use. Um, and it's also just, I think, a, an issue um, that it's important to support our local agriculture in any kind of disruption that we might have, earthquake or terror attack or whatever, it's nice to know that there's some food in our area you know, that we could get. So support these folks. Um, I want to say a few things now about fat, because we've got a 
few minutes left. Um, it's good to keep the omega-6 to omega-3 ratio closer to 4 to 1, okay? The sad thing is that these, um, again, polyunsaturated fatty acids that come from corn, soy, safflower, sunflower, um, cottonseed, and if you start reading your labels, you'll see how many times those show up on processed food. Um, these tend to be more pro-inflammatory compared to the anti-inflammatory omega-3s. And when we get too many of those omega-6 fatty acids, we do run a higher risk of a number of different cancers. There's a greater tendency to store fat in our body there's a higher risk of heart disease, and there's also some very interesting work um, on the association with mood disorders. So um, just staying away from fried food is one really good way of getting your ratio back to where it should be. And also, I like people to try to stay away from all oils that are out of their natural vehicle, okay? So, you know, like, eat your walnuts, but don't do walnut oil, okay? Eat your edamame, okay, which is green soybeans, but try not to use soybean oil, okay? Eat your corn, but again, try not to use too much corn oil or products that are made with it. Um, so, you have a little thing on the slide here that says corn versus canola. Canola and avocado, uh, excuse me, olive and canola are the two oils that are considered, if you're going to use an oil in a bottle, those are the ones to choose, okay? They're monounsaturated. They're not, you know, they're not really high in these omega-6 fatty acids. But as much as possible, try not to use too much isolated fat. You're going to be better off. And then, you know, do get your fish a um, couple of servings a week. The guidance for keeping the ratios where they should be to reduce your tendency toward inflammation are listed. And that is to eat fish or seafood. The American Heart Association says two times a week, probably three times would be even better. Um, I'm fond of saying that I'm learning to love sardines because they're low on the food chain and inexpensive. And she just did a little face over here, but you can learn to love them. They're pretty good with capers, um, with lemon rind, with Kalamata olives. You know, all the things that have like a really strong flavor add to them, it'll be better. Um, choosing the monounsaturated oils like we talked about, um, minimizing our exposure to those um, high in omega-6 like corn and soy. Um, and really reading your labels. For example, you, if you love mayonnaise and are careful with how much you use, Trader Joe's does have a canola oil mayonnaise that you can get. So try to avoid the ones made with, with soy or corn. Um, and then be aware that the way we feed our animals today has changed the character of their carcass fat. We used to pasture our animals and we, you know, pastured them up to the time they were killed and eaten. And now we take them off pasture, and we put them in feedlots, and we feed them corn and soy. So it changes over a few weeks the type of fats that are in their carcass to be more pro-inflammatory. Um, so when you can get grass-finished cattle, that's better. If you have a way to get wild game, that would be pastured all the way, you know, until you eat it. Um, the free-range chickens um, are a good choice because, you know, chickens used to go around and, like, eat, you know, weeds, okay? And when you ate green things, pasture grass or weeds, you actually got the precursors of these omega-3 oils, which then the animal changed into the type that's most biologically active. So when they were pastured or eating grass and weeds, they actually had fat in their body or in their eggs that was healthier than what we get today. The guidance for um, omega-3 fatty acid intake is the American Heart Association says eat fish twice a week. 
um, and try to include other sources of omega-3 that include flaxseed and le leafy green vegetables have omega-3 fats in them, which is kind of a surprise um, if you eat a big enough amount. Um, this international guideline actually specifies the amount of EPA and DHA, which are the biologically active forms. They're a little bit more biologically active and protective than the omega-3s that come from flax, for example, or leafy greens. Um, if a person has heart disease, they probably need like 1,000 milligrams a day. Um, if they have to lower triglycerides, it has to be even higher. But the thing to remember is when you use really high amounts of these omega-3 fish oils, you, ha you can have a tendency to bleed hemorrhagic stroke. So you have to go easy, and if you're going to have any kind of procedure that would involve surgery, you have to let the doctor know that you're using those. Barry Sears recommends a much higher amount, and um, it's actually sort of a little bit too high to feel safe, but I just wanted you to see that there's disagreement out there in the community about how much. I would probably feel more comfortable with the American Heart Association or Particularly, um, Simopoulos is one of the researchers who's really well grounded in this area, so that um, amount would also be good. Okay, um, you can get the omega 3 uh, fish oils from two or three servings of fish, and this actually says how many ounces of cooked seafood you would need to get 1,000 milligrams per day of. EPA and DHA, which are the biologically active forms of fish oil. Um, so did you see my sardines? Two to three ounces, which is one of those little tins. OK, so OK. Um, there are other sources of um, these that come from plants. I'm going to whip through this now, because I just want to say a couple of things about vitamin D. Um, you've probably heard some speakers talking about vitamin D. There's just such interesting work coming out in this area. Um, I highly recommend you going to this website called grassrootshealth.org. There's wonderful videos that you can listen to and make up your own mind about vitamin D. But there's very good evidence that vitamin D plays some critical roles in immune functioning and helps prevent a number of chronic diseases, potentially including um, cancer. Um, I'm just going to go straight to this. The recommendation currently from the Institute of Medicine is 200 to 600 units per day, but the scientists um, who are most actively doing research in this area feel that it's actually very important to get somewhere between 1,000 and 2,000 units of vitamin D per day. Um, particularly if you don't get regular sunlight exposure. And one thing about sunlight exposure, we, we're lucky in Southern California because actually we could make vitamin D from sunlight if we don't put sunscreen on. Um, and in terms of damage from sun and um, skin cancer, one of the really nice practical suggestions was expose more of your body to sun. You know, rather than be out in the sun for a really long time with just a little bit exposed like your face, um, you know, actually have your arms exposed and your legs exposed, have more of your body square inches. And then you don't have to be out as long to actually be able to make D. So you can make some D from sun, but we really encourage people to have their blood levels tested and find out if your level is adequate because we're more and more finding that people with cancer have chronically low levels. And it's really a good idea to see what your level is and then supplement until you get it up to where it should be. And it should be somewhere between 30 and 40 nanograms per ml. But you can use this slide as a guidance. So I'm almost at the end, so we have time for questions. The lifestyle recommendations to reduce chronic disease are listed. And it is a plant-based diet that has several servings, four to five servings, half cup servings of vegetables a day, preferably colorful, two to three servings of fruits, two to three servings of whole grains, and one half to one serving of beans per day. So that means basically a half cup every other day, and you'll be OK for beans. Um, limit your red meat to three ounces or less per day. What's the problem with red meat? 
of course, we're always going to think, you know, it's saturated fat and heart disease, and of course, that's one of the issues. But in general, when you think red meat, think large land animals. Large land animals. They've been around a long time. They're concentrating environmental toxins. Eat lower on the food chain, really, for health, okay? And if you're going to do red meat, go easy on it. Um, and when you can get grass finished, that's a good thing. Um, and by the way, when you're going to do, you know, milk products, go for the lower fat because there'll be less, you know, fat-soluble pesticides, and spend the money on organic. Okay, it's again, it's voting. Um, it was really wonderful that there there is movement in that direction as more of our food dollars are spent for healthier food. Um, Maintain a healthy weight. Um, exercise every day. I can't tell you how important it is to combine exercise with diet because a healthy cardiovascular system is what delivers nutrients out to our cells and takes away the toxic byproducts. So you've got to have it all working together for maximum health. Go easy on alcoholic beverages and charcoal and smoked foods. Um, I like to bring the bottom line in that came from Michael Pollan's wonderful book called In Defense of Food. Have any of you read that? A couple of you have. It's just a great little book, and it's very easy reading. Um, he says, eat food. In other words, eat food and not food products, because you are what you eat and you don't want to be made out of ding-dongs. Um, not too much so that you, you know, don't creep up with weight, mostly plants as we've talked about. Drink enough water so your body can flush out the toxins. Eat slower, okay, because that actually helps you chew the food in smaller bits. You get more nutrients out of it. And it also helps your tummy to relax, you know, so that you actually can digest the stuff properly. I like to say practice gratitude, which is take a little moment, you know, before a meal. We used to, like, do a little blessing. Um, but just take a moment to think of what it took to bring that food to you. Somebody prepared it, somebody grew it, harvested it, processed it. You know, take a little moment to think about that. That will also help to calm you down and you will get more out of the food that you're eating and probably won't have to eat as much. So that would be saving calories. And then I talked about exercise. And let's just let you read these, but Michael Pollan has some great tips. Um, useful tips like shopping the perimeter of the market and if you go into the middle be careful um, he says avoid food products containing ingredients that are unfamiliar unpronounceable or more than five in number in other words eat basic food pay more so you eat less I'm always telling people to go out and spend a lot of money on extra virgin olive oil the really green extra fruity tasting one because you'll use a little less of it because it's expensive and the flavor is so intense it goes a long way. Um, eat meals and eat at a table. I'm all the time asking my staff, don't eat in front of the computer. Like, leave. Go outside for a few minutes. Enjoy your food, okay? It's important to do that. Don't get your food, your fuel from the same place your car does. I love that one. And I'll leave you with this. Consult your gut. Um, lots of people will tell you what to eat, okay? But only you know how the food you eat makes you feel. So each person has certain foods, probably, you know, that don't agree with them. And just because an expert or somebody comes up here and says, eat them, if it doesn't make you feel good, don't. But really pay attention. Get in touch, all right? Because what you want to do is eat in a way that actually kind of energizes you. You don't want to feel like pooped out after a meal, right? So that's where fresh comes in. So um, I gave you a couple more websites that I really encourage you to visit. These are wonderful people working for healthier food in this country, and heaven knows we need healthier food <laughs> choices because there's lots of bad choices. So I'm going to leave it at that, and thank you for your attention, and I'll take questions if you have some. Your hand so I could bring you the mic. I'd appreciate it. Uh, just a quick question. You talked about insecticides. If you wash all, are the insecticides internal to the plant, or can you wash them off? Some of them do go internal. So, so washing yeah. is no good. 
Um, washing does a little good with the surface ones, and there are those um, vegetable <laughs> washing solutions, which are surface active agents that help to wash some of it off. So it, it's a good idea, but I don't go wild with those, like with leafy vegetables, you know. Um, but anything that has a skin, you should wash it a little bit. That's a good thing to do. Um, but some of it does go in. So, okay. Anything else? Mm -hmm. Our winner. Oh, okay. You go ahead because you've oh, got the. Okay. All right. Um, first, hello. Uh -huh. Okay. Thank you for the presentation. It was lovely. Thank um, you. I was just wondering if you could speak about, you know, you were talking about juices such as V8, um, but also naked juices are very popular now and trendy, but I'm always um, just in question when I look at the nutrition label and I see that there's zero grams of fiber and they boast that they have all these vegetables and fruits. And so I was wondering why there isn't that fiber, and you started to touch on that, but why isn't there fiber in there when they're saying they have X amount of servings and also should those juices just kind of be avoided and that they're just kind of a, a trap? Well, that's a good question about juices, because in the well study, we asked women to eat 12 servings of fruits and vegetables a day, and they actually, there was so much fiber in 12 servings that they just couldn't do it. So part of their fruits and vegetable nutrients came from juices, but they were fresh. We had them actually juice their own vegetables. Um, so the, I think the role for juices is kind of as a backup if you can't meet your fruit and vegetable intake from real whole fruits and vegetables. Um, there's no fiber because when you juice it, you're taking the fiber away and throwing it away, which is a sad loss of something that's really good for you. So that's the reason that there's no fiber. But what it does do is it releases the water and fat soluble nutrients from the cell walls. So you're getting a lot of the juice nutrients minus the fiber, okay? Um, did you notice, though, that on the pesticide contamination list, carrots were there? So um, carrots are wonderfully healthy for us, but if you don't buy organic carrots and you buy a bag that may not be organic and you're going to juice a ton of carrots to make a cup of juice, that's a little bit of a worry, you know, in terms, again, of concentration. So um, when you eat the carrot and you get the fiber in the carrot, the fiber can actually sometimes um, decrease pesticide absorption because it's going to speed transit through the gut. And sometimes it also holds on to some of these fat soluble components. So fiber is really important for that reason. So I would say vegetables and fruit are much better than juice, but juice can work as a backup. OK? Uh huh. And you had a question back here. Hello. Uh -huh. um, I've been hearing more about celiac disease. Uh huh. The whole uh, no gluten thing and yeah, gluten-free diets. Relate. Uh, how much of a problem do you think this really is? I think it's kind of a new thing on the scene. Uh, it's actually kind of a big problem. It truly is. Um, the the general understanding that we have of gluten intolerance is that somewhere near one out of every 120 adults that are um, of Caucasian background. If you looked at, you know, sort of US, Canada, and you kind of said, look at all the adults, um, there's groups of people that are more prone to not being able to handle gluten. Um, and in general, it could be as much as one in every 120. So it's, it's a good idea to get that sorted out. Uh, doctors have ways that they can do that. Some people just choose to go off of gluten for a period of time and see if they feel better. And gluten is in wheat, and it could be a little bit in oats or as a contaminant. So oftentimes we take people off wheat and oats um, and rye. So they're kind of limited to things like rice and corn in terms of the grains that, that we know of. But it, it is, um, you might think it's hype, but there, it is a concern. Okay. Any other questions? Uh -huh. uh, yes. Do you have any thoughts on microwaving food, say microwaving a potato versus baking it? Um, that's a good one, microwaving. Um, I think microwaving is a wonderful um, way to cook to save time. 
the the issue is that it it doesn't it from a standpoint of making vegetables delicious it sometimes overcooks them in a way that they're partially either undercooked or mushy or almost dry so i am actually not in favor of cooking with a microwave for vegetables. I would much rather see people steam with a little bit of water and have some more control over it. Um, a potato does save time. Uh, it unfortunately doesn't taste as wonderful as a baked potato. So I think it works in a pinch, but it wouldn't necessarily be what I would recommend for maximum satisfaction. Okay. But you don't see any difference in nutritional value? Um, no. Actually, in some sense, because you're cooking it in its own juice, there's actually potentially some benefit if you don't overcook it. So from a nutritional standpoint, I would say it's OK. Uh, you okay. talked a little bit about supplements in terms of vitamin D. What do you think about supplements in general for vitamins and minerals? We always would like people to get their food first. Um, their nutrients from food, but a well-balanced multiple, I think, is there's a lot to be said for that. Um, what we find in our research in cancer prevention and a number of different published studies is there's something called a U-shaped curve, which you've probably heard about. So an inadequate amount of a nutrient is not a good thing from deficiency disease standpoint. Adequate's good, and then excessive can be bad again. So just kind of not overdoing it in terms of supplements. But having said that, most of us that are interested in wellness um, use extra antioxidants like vitamin C. CoQ10, did you see that on some of the, okay, which is very important in terms of energy production. Um, our CoQ10 levels tend to go down as we get older. If any of you are on statins, you can also have your CoQ10 levels decreased, and so taking a supplement of CoQ10 is a good idea. Alpha lipoic acid is antioxidant, um, and no toxicity that I know of associated with it. So I would say that there are certain of the antioxidant supplements that are actually very helpful. I think the thing that people run into that is difficult, and you kind of remember the era when we were doing studies with carotene, um, and some of those studies actually had to be stopped early because the carotene supplements were making people have a higher risk of certain cancers. Um, when you take one carotenoid like beta carotene out of a food that has this array of carotenoids, you might be causing some problems. So I think, I think supplements have their role, okay? Just go easy, okay? That's such a huge topic. Like, what do you say in what two minutes? I think okay. we have time for one more question. Another? Uh huh. I've been hearing a lot more about mercury in fish. Is that a concern that you have when you say you have maybe three servings of fish? Which I love fish, so. Yeah. But I haven't been mercury tested either, <laughs> so. <laughs> um, that's a really good point that you bring up, and that's another reason to eat lower on the food chain. The larger fish tend to have more mercury in them. And I think um, you saw on the slide that I had that showed you the amount of omega-3, I had some fish that were highlighted as better choices and some that weren't highlighted because they are more prone to having problems. Um, on that slide, I referred you to the Monterey Bay Aquarium website. They have really wonderful downloadable printable guides that tell you the better choices. And there's definitely certain types of tuna, you know, which can be delicious in a you know, tuna sandwich, but there are certain types of tuna that are better avoided because of mercury or at least limit your amount. But the Monterey Bay Aquarium is a wonderful website that'll actually address that, okay? But low on the food chain, sardines are always okay, okay? All right, thank you very much. Thank you, Vicki. Uh -huh. And I'd like to thank you all for participating today. I just want to get heads up the next April the 27th, we're fortunate enough to have Vicki back. This time her topic will be, is it myth or fact that eating an overly acidic based diet, for example, sodas and processed food, can cause illness and even cancer? So we look forward to seeing you then. Thank you.
This has been a UC San Diego Blinkcast. For more, visit us online at blinkcast.ucsd.edu.